I have and will always believe that I'm a representative of my history, surrounding, and location in time and space. Hello everyone, my name is Ola Idris Ali. I'm a Sudanese origin and I was raised in Kampala, Uganda. Four years ago, I immigrated to Canada. I study political science, economics, and business at the University of Waterloo, and I'm incredibly interested in learning about African politics and its positionality in the world societal systems. My academics, however, only defines a small part of who I am. I am also a community enthusiast, a writer, a learner, a sister and a daughter, and everything in between. I've also had the honor of being involved in social justice and cultural activities at Waterloo and elsewhere. I introduced myself in this way because I believe that each piece has opened me up to a phenomenal range of experiences that have shaped me into the person speaking to you today. They create my positionality, which in turn affects how I view the world and interpret the things happening in my life. In 2019, I witnessed what will always be a life-changing series of events. Millions of Sudanese people poured out onto the streets to protest a tyrannical regime that had deteriorated the standards of living in Sudan. The first months saw solidarity being formed through neighborhood resistance committees and peaceful demonstrations being met with tear gas, live ammunition, and extreme levels of violence from the government and military forces. The people, however, persisted, and on April 6th, they created something I can only describe as magical, a two-month peaceful sit-in. Five days later, after a 30-year rule, Ahmed al-Bashir is oust and his predecessor Ibn Arof follows him 36 hours later. As the revolution progressed, I started to redefine my relationship with Sudan. See, because I had grown up in Uganda, I always felt as though I was in a state of double consciousness. I always felt too Sudanese for Uganda and too Ugandan for Sudan. And so throughout 2019, I became more involved on conversations on identity and furthering my understanding of the concept of intersectionality, especially now that I was in the West. I had the chance to delve into learning about philosophies of Black and African thinkers who spoke on Pan-Africanism, collectivism, and the global liberation struggle. Some of these were Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of an independent Ghana, W.E. Du Bois, a prominent Black economist, Amy Jacques Garvey, a Jamaican journalist and leader of collectivist thought, Angela Davis, a Black author and political activist who I had the pleasure of meeting last year, John Gudang, a collectivist leader in Sudan, Tom Oboya, one of the founding fathers of Kenya, and Mahmoud Mohamed Taha, an Islamic reformist and political thinker in Sudan. During this time, I was starting to see the red line that was connecting between these impossible ideas that were thought of years ago and how they were practically being applied in Sudan by protesters subconsciously. Protesters were laying the groundwork for African socialist ideas to bloom without labeling it. African socialism, not to be confused with Western socialism, can be referred to as a system that allows a person to become a person through the people or community, and it celebrated the idea of mutual social responsibility. To me, that was the integral part of focusing on a communal goal versus the individualistic goal. It's important to make this distinction because African socialism stems from African culture and African norms that lacked class assistance and promoted neighborhood positivity and shared responsibility. The sit-in in Sudan quickly became a beacon of this. It acted as a reflection of the success of the Sudan under civilian rule and one feeding off community support. It brought together people from different walks of life, dismantling racial, ethnic, and classist barriers. It will always break my heart a little bit that I couldn't be there in person and that I engaged with this revolution through watching endless live videos online and listening to my friends and family back home describe it to me. This, however, gave me a new perspective to further understanding the concept of revolution, cross-border solidarity, and notably, the integral piece the diaspora plays. Sudanese everywhere were creating and engaging with the language of our revolution. Those on the ground had donated time to heal those that were hurt, were building makeshift schools and shelters for homeless children, 
We're documenting stories of revolutionaries and communities and working together to feed millions of people every single day during the holy month of Ramadan. The rest of the world might have gotten a peek at the glory of this revolution when this powerful photo by Ala Saleh, taken by Lana Harun, went viral. And if they didn't then, then they definitely saw our cries when the sit-in was brutally dispersed and burned to the ground on June 3rd by military forces. The government had also employed one of their favorite tactics and shut off the internet in Sudan. And so, as the country went into the dark, the diaspora lit the world blue. For weeks, this was all you could see online, a dedication to the martyrs of Sudan. And it was started by the friends and family of one martyr in specific, Muhammad Hashim Madar. This was his favorite shade of blue. All it takes is one spark. And so without any internet connection, Sudanese people were still able to organize two million man marches, continuing to demand for systematic change. And with them, rose hundreds of cities around the world in solidarity marches. What was truly admirable about the Sudanese revolution was the anonymity of leaders and the decentralization of the movement. This allowed for a breaking down of hierarchies and a blooming of horizontal leadership structures. It created a restructuring to what resistance and revolution were, completely reimagining what the political ecosystem in Sudan would be. It highlighted the importance of having women and youth at the forefront, driving the change, not as a second thought. It also emphasized the value of centering the stories and history of Sudanese folk from Darfur and the other regions that were most affected by the regime. The revolution allowed me to witness the diversity in resistance itself. Folks were using art, poetry, film, music, panels, engineering, cooking, manual labor, and teachers, all as drivers of resistance and rehabilitation. Organizations in the diaspora created think tanks to consolidate the brain drain and refeed it back into the country in order to support those on the ground, not to speak for them. Youth on Twitter beat the concept of a single story, debunking rumors and sharing information in organic ways and not depending on big conglomerate news stations to speak our truth. I was observing all of this change and revolution and resistance and was adamant to start applying it in my everyday life. I used my time as the president of the Black Association at UW to recognize the brilliance of everybody's individual pieces and what they brought to the community at large. For example, our extremely talented graphic designer and my right hand, Kiara Mapp, is also a great playlist curator. And so thanks to her, we had bumping music at every single event. <laughs> I try my best to highlight voices that are not mine or that are less likely to be heard. So by citing their accounts and their work, it becomes my own form of resistance. It gives all of you the chance to go and check out the work because nobody can tell their story better than they can. As 2019 came to a close, I learned my most important lesson. I was allowed to unplug. I realized I spent so much time absorbing and engaging with content that I was continuously exposing my mind to people being shot, to stories of rape and harassment, and I could start to feel the toll on my psyche of continuously being exposed to visual and auditory trauma. I purged all my online accounts of all harmful content, even if that meant that I felt disconnected from accounts that were still reporting on changes in Sudan. By creating my online space to be a space of healing, I allowed myself to learn in healthy ways, like reading online books or listening to uplifting podcasts. My understanding of our relationship with the internet completely changed. And as I became intentional with the data that I was taking in, I realized how revolutionary that was in itself, that I didn't always have to be consuming Black and African death that the system seemed to feed off. What I didn't know then was the changes that I was making personally would be amplified in 2020. While we were plunged into what every email loves to start off with, unprecedented times, 
we began to fully witness the power of the internet and mass movements. The assassinations of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others by the state sparked frustration of Black people across the globe under the Black Lives Matter banner. The same revolution I had watched spark back home was suddenly everywhere. And this wasn't only limited to the West. We see now how other African countries have also taken it upon themselves to demand change, like Mali, Nigeria, Namibia, and the Congo. The internet became a space of teaching folks how to tackle white supremacy, to demand building, abolishing police structures, and taking more steps into completely eradicating the current capitalist, imperialist, and racist global system. I was careful with engaging with the outpour of trauma online this time round, and rather focused my energy to create spaces for myself of growth and positivity. I had the privilege of joining Trad Magazine, a space curated to reclaim what it means to be African and Black. I got the chance to widen my network and meet so many other folks who are passionate about change and growth and just wonderfully existing while reclaiming our ancestral power. I took more time to rest because I believe that rest in itself is resistance. I became intentional with self-care, and that didn't always mean putting on a face mask, but sometimes it meant spending hours disconnected from my phone and being in nature. Self-care also meant that I gave myself space to explore my other hobbies, as I'm sure a lot of you did that during the lockdown. This year, I actually started painting. In recognizing that resistance and revolution are dynamic and happen by us healing from our traumas and shifting our focus on self and community care, we become the revolution itself. By participating in small changes and being intentional on how we are contributing to the conversation, we help move the dial forward. So I am dedicating myself to continuously be learning, to become more teachable, and by focusing on working towards a communal goal, we as a society continue to learn from each other, to correct ourselves, to make our lives, the lives of those coming after us, better. And a new world is forming and growing today. And I think it's great to see us grow with it. Thank you, and long live the revolution.